Welcome to the Lippus Report. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's Nick Lippus here. Uh, we're at ISIM City. ICSI is ISIM City here in Santa Clara in their modern facility. And we've been testing the Extreme X8, which is a very large switch, 700 and over 768 10 gigabit Ethernet ports, 192 40 gigabit Ethernet ports, uh, a massive size switch, bigger than anything we've seen in the industry so far, and also their top rack switch, their X670V uh, as well. So uh, we're going to talk about that, and we're also going to talk about how Extreme is now approaching the data center marketplace uh, for cloud networking with Darius Goodall uh, from Extreme. And so first we're going to talk about these two particular products. So Darius, welcome. Thank um, you. Thank you. It's nice. Me. Excellent. Glad you're all here. Why don't you actually just tell everyone a little bit about what you do at Extreme, and then we'll jump yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Um, so I head up the uh, product and technical marketing group. So we do all the benchmarking, evaluations, competitive analysis, all that kind of stuff. And uh, here, as you say, we're, we're, we're here to talk about the X8 and uh, the 670, which is uh, really astounding. I mean, it's great for us. Okay, That's great. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, well, let's start. <coughs> let's let's talk about it. And uh, one thing I want to also just clue you all in, we, we actually finished testing uh, just about 10 minutes ago. And what we found is that on the X8 in particular, it's about 10 times, between 3 and 10 times faster than anything we've tested before uh, in the lab. And we've tested a lot of products. So, uh, so congratulations on that. But let's make sure everyone's up to speed on what the X8 is and also the 670. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So some of the some of the major highlights of the box. So uh, it's very, very high density. We do, uh, set out to to really design this box for cloud scale architectures. Nick, mm -hmm. um, we're talking about 192 ports of 40 gig or 768 ports of 10 gig. And of course, as you know, with the 40 gig, that's exactly the same card giving you the 10 gig at 768 ports, right? So some of the typical deployments that mm -hmm. we'll see is even down to as much as uh, a collapsed architecture where we've got one x8. Uh, just providing uh, providing us a single tier architecture, and for those people who want the extra the extra uh, endpoints or the uh, uh, the extra density, then we can go forward to a two tier architecture right? mm. and expand our fabric up to two tiers, and incorporating the X670 at the bottom side, then we'll leverage the 10 gig ports at the bottom, okay, at the edge rather, mm -hmm. and an uplink using the four by forty three to one over subscribed. Uh, all the way up into the X8, up into the uh, core. So we've got a true two-tier architecture with a beautiful fabric to tie it all together. Actually, let's let's talk about that one-tier architecture. So how are you all defining that, and kind of how does that scale? Okay, so 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 the single-tier architecture. Uh, we, we just you just heard what I said about that. I mean that's a sing, that's a single box solution. But actually, the way to deploy it in a in a data center is in a resilient architecture. Okay, so this means that you have two BDXs side by side that gives you that res resilience. Okay, so you're taking your servers, you're plugging them in, dual homing them one to each BDX, and that gives you 768 uh, ports of 10 gig in a single tier architecture that's fully redundant, fully resilient. Okay, great. Actually, I wanted to talk a little bit about maybe. One, the density is unique, but is there any other attributes that are unique to both the X8 and the 670, particularly in virtualization and in cloud networking? Yeah, for sure. So, um, of course, you know, w w with the way that virtualization is affecting networks, Nick, uh, traditionally we saw most of the traffic being north-south inside, uh, mm. inside the rack, right? So uh, now with virtualization taking a, a real firm grip on the data centers, we're seeing a hell of a lot more east-west traffic, right? So hence, we need to be able to collapse the tiers. We need the lower latency. We need to be able to, to move traffic east-west in a manner that really uh, oversubscription is doesn't no longer becomes an issue, right? Mm. So, and we can't use the older protocols such as spanning tree that means that all the traffic has to go up through the root bridge and all the way back down, okay? This is not how we do some virtualization. This is not a good solution for virtualization, right? So leveraging open standards, okay, and in our case, uh, MLAG, we're able to uh, allow that virtualization path for east-west to, to be enabled and very in, in a very, very slick manner. Uh, in actual fact, I mean, we were, we, we were constantly running our own tests ourselves, mm. and we've seen virt virtualization uh, or uh, VM migrations happen um, across XNV, which is our platform for virtualization, in which we interf interface to VMware, Citrix, mm. uh, very soon uh, Microsoft as well. Um, in which we've seen these migrations happening as much as up to 40 gig, right? And so these migrations happen extremely fast, and certainly with the low latency, it definitely helps that. Yeah, yeah, very good. You know, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because um, as you were as you were talking about this, uh, one thing about uh, VM that we hear a lot about, and especially a real difficulty we have with networking, is how rigid and static networking, you know, has been in this right. three-tier structure within within uh, our within our three-tier architectures, and how that creates a lot of reconfiguration. Requirements 
requirement when we move VMs from one place to the other. So you have a couple different solutions there now to, to address this, right? So do you right. want to talk a little so, bit about that? So specifically, I mean, there's, there's two exactly, as you mentioned. Um, and they're all, uh, one of them is about reducing uh, the, the network tiers even further, right? Mm -hmm. So there's another layer that we haven't spoken about, which is really around the virtualization layer or the vSwitch layer, mm -hmm. okay? So we're dealing, with that, uh, we're dealing with that in a method that we call direct attach, which is actually more better industry, well known in the industry as Vapor or v Vipa. Yeah. Um, so here what we're doing is we're, we're bypassing the virtual switch with inside the hypervisor and the, the Vipa standard allows us to take the traffic uh, up to the uh, to the switch to the appliance where we can switch it at wire speed. We can tra uh, transport traffic at wire speed, and then if the traffic is to designated with inside the same server, which is typically the case, then that traffic can come straight back down. Now yeah. the good thing about this is, of course, we're not stranding any assets. Okay, so if you've got firewalls that are sitting up somewhere inside the network that uh, the the virtual switch might not be able to deal with, then of course we can deal with all of this at wire speed back up at the switch at the appliance, which in which switching was intended to uh, to occur in the first. Place. Yeah. So that's great. But so there's, an, there's other benefits as well, of course, right? So uh, in actually freeing up the virtual switch uh, cycles as well, we can actually return more power back from, from, uh, to the CPU to be able to do what virtualization was intended to do in the first place, right? As we see, the virtualization ratio is increasing, increasing, increasing as time goes on, right? right? So that's very important. So no stranding of assets and freeing up resources to, to do what they also need to do. Now the other thing is as well with, with Vipa, I mean one of the biggest drive, drivers for Vipa of course is the fact that we're, not only are we introducing another virtual switching layer, but we're also introducing another type of switch inside the network as well, okay, which could have a different set of standards, different set of functionality, and a different set of tools to actually be able to, uh, to, 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 be able to view what's going on inside mm -hmm. there, right? So we're bringing that back in, we're bringing that control, that visibility back up into the networking layer where the network manager can take this functionality out of the out of the server leave the server guys to do what the server guys do best and leave the network guys to do what the network guys do best okay great and uh, and also just kind of a note to the uh, to the audience here too is that what we're starting to see with uh, virtual appliances is that while it's really great to have that functionality virtualized um, we're starting to see some real performance issues uh, with them as well. And so we're going to be doing a lot more about that uh, during uh, some future tests. But what's interesting to me about this approach is that you kind of suck out um, the switching out of the server, uh, out of the uh, kind of vSwitch uh, domain, and put it into the switch, switch it um, at wire speed, um, and offload that you know, from the servers. And so that might be more and more important, especially as the ratio, uh, right now we're almost at right, 20 to 1 ratio of VMs right. to physical servers. That's going pretty quickly to 60 to 1 from what I've seen with kind of 12 core processors exactly. Um, um, exactly. being available. Okay, great. Um, so actually I had a couple questions around 2 tier, 3 tier. I think we already answered that. Mm -hmm. um, also, you might have alluded a little bit to um, kind of spanning tree uh, avoidance, you know. So um, what's the protocol that you guys are suggesting there? So why don't we spend a moment on that and then... Yeah, absolutely. So, so Nick, uh, honestly, what we've what we've done. I mean, our, our philosophy over at Extreme is one of uh, very much open architectures, open interoperability, and so on. Okay, so uh, customers, our customers, our prospects get to choose the best of breed, no matter how they come. Now, so there's a lot of there's a lot of other alternative uh, technologies out there. Of course, we're seeing uh, you know several different types of fabric evolve out in the market. Uh, we've chosen to put a stake in the sand with MLAG. Okay, mm -hmm. it's simple. It's well understood. Mm -hmm. The majority of the vendors, the majority of the servers, NIC vendors, you name it, they all know MLAG. They embrace it. They use it today. So there's a so so there's that. I mean, there's the, the MLAG gives you a, a, a variety of options in either active, 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 passive. Mm -hmm. So of course we're no longer constrained with the, the limitations of STP, whereby we've provisioned all these links. Okay, but we're only a, in, in in essence at best using half of what we've actually provisioned. Okay, meaning half the bandwidth, mm -hmm. and we're actually only making use of half the cost that we actually uh, acquired. Uh, acquired, right? right? Yeah. So. So the other thing is as well, in line with the openness and the interoperability, um, when we go into an architecture or we go into an existing da data center, okay, where there might be some existing uh, infrastructure there, as long as they support MLAG, it doesn't mean that the customer has to face that forklift upgrade. Mm. Okay? Yeah. We can just integrate them in. Again, the beauty of using uh, open standards. Excellent, Darius. Well, also, in the beginning, I talked about latency and the numbers that you guys, that we've been uh, measuring, which are really impressive. Um, better than anything we've seen. The other dimension has been around power uh, and how low your power drawer is and the watts per 10 gigabit ethernet port. So why don't we talk a little bit about that and, um, and what you're also um, recommending folks that are designing 
cloud spec data centers and what kind of power requirements they're going to need. Okay, exactly, exactly Nick, honestly. So um, one of the biggest concerns uh, today is, is probably power consumption. When you're set, setting out to design a data center or a cloud spec data center and so on, so uh, you, specking that out for electricity, power consumption, everything is absolutely paramount. Okay, because we all know that you're going to spend more money in calling it, so you don't want to get caught into that too much. So uh, we're very pleased. We're, we're, we're way down, uh, on average, 5 watts or lower per, per, per 10 gigabit port. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an impressive number, too, because we've been measuring below that, you know, here so far, and uh, that's about, you know, half of what we've been seeing other products in the marketplace. Right, right, right. Okay, great. Well, last question. All right. Um, we now are getting at really low latency speeds. We're going to have high density. We're getting a lot more bandwidth. Um, and I think that's starting to open up the opportunity uh, for um, basically IT business leaders to be more comfortable with putting storage on top of their uh, network fabric. So really have a fabric that supports both storage and networking. What's the strategy from Extreme there? Perfect. So, um, so yeah, I mean, ultimately, we uh, well, actually, even now, we support the full DCB, DCBX, ETS, PFC, and so on, all those protocols, right? Uh, on top of that, we have uh, another protocol that we use, which is Clearflow, which allows us to, to identify uh, traffic types like iSCSI through the network and guarantee bandwidth through them. And of course, if you know how ETS and PFC works, it goes further to actually allow that to, 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 to become more viable on a converged enhanced Ethernet. Right? Mm. So, uh, we support all those protocols. And of course, none of this is complete without actually upgrading the bandwidth, because a lot of the existing uh, storage type architectures rely on the uh, higher layers of Ethernet to become reliable, okay? So if you have that congestion inside the network, you might get TCP act timeouts and so on. Mm. So in this case, throwing bandwidth at the solution, at the problem is somewhat of a solution, and mm. it works very well when you combine, combine it with some of the latest protocols that are coming out, and it creates an absolutely perfect solution when you combine it all together with Extreme. Okay. okay? So um, while we do support, have support for FCOE, and we've been to UNH, we've done all the interoperability testing, and the results are fantastic for that, um, you know, the, the path is one of iSCSI, ultimately, uh, uh, in fact, that's, that's what we believe. Mm -hmm. But in the long run, absolutely, we support fiber channel and fiber channel over Ethernet through our partners. Excellent. Great. Well, we've been talking to Darius Goodall from Extreme Networks uh, here at ISIM City. Uh, thank you, everyone, for plugging in and uh, look to the report uh, in a couple of weeks. Thank you, everyone. That concludes this edition of the Lippus Report. Thank you for joining us.